Ramadan is here. Recite the Quran. We pray to Allah to put right our hearts. Ask for forgiveness and make a new start. Raising our hands, we ask for His Rahmah. Hear us, our Lord, and grant us Jannah. Ramadan is here, the month that is blessed. Ramadan is here, the month we love best. Ramadan Fatawa. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ramadan Fatawa. I'm your host, Jimmy Rashid. And I'm with today, Sheikh Muhammad Salah. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh, for being with us. Okay, let me remind you of our telephone numbers. The country code is 202, then it's 3855528 and 249. Our email address is ask, ask at huda. TV. And if you are calling today, please do start calling from now. And if you do call, please do turn down your television sets. Okay, Sheikh, we've got a question pending. Uh, Brother Mansour from Nigeria. Uh, if I understood his question uh, correctly, he's asking about how to clear away blood that retains in the mound. Say, for example, you have a mouth bleed or blood comes from the north into your mouth. How do you get rid of this, especially in Ramadan? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiyihi wa mustafa. All praise be to Allah. We praise him and we seek his help. Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one. And whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can show him guidance. May the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whether it is uh, uh, blood or mucus or sputum, if it is accumulated in one's mouth, nose, uh, and the nasal area, if he swallows that after it already gathered in the mouth cavity, that would cause iftar. So the person would break his fast. And if the person uh, makes his utmost to spit this out regularly and every time it accumulates, even if it is an excessive bleeding, then uh, it would not affect his fasting by any means, even if it happened to enter by mistake. But if the person uh, is lying down and uh, the mucus that gathers or the blood, he swallows it, that breaks his fast. Jazakallah Hashak. Okay, um, we had another question from Nigeria, Brother Bilu. He was asking about uh, putting perfume on your body, putting perfume on before going to the mosque. He said his wife said this is not something that uh, you should do in excessiveness. Um, I've heard it about women, but about men, Sheikh? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I believe that the sister may be a little bit confused concerning uh, who should not wear any perfume mm -hmm. upon going to the masjid. Uh, first of all, Allah the Almighty says, Ya Bani Adam, akhudu zinatakum ma'inda kulli masjid. This is a divine command that whenever we're going to the place of worship, mm -hmm. we should put on our best clothes and wear uh, the favorite perfume or fragrance. This is for men. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ used to love perfume so much and uh, used to have a special outfit that we would use upon going to the masjid, particularly Salatul Jumu'ah wal Eidain. And he said, حُبِّبَ إِلَيَّ مِن دُنْيَاكُمْ أَطِّيبُ He used to love fragrance so much. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ advised men upon going to the masjid not only to wear what's nice and brush their teeth, but if they can afford to wear any perfume or fragrance, uh, let them do so. Uh, he prescribed among the traditions of attending the Jum'ah prayer particularly, an yaghtasil, to take a bath, wa an yastanna, and to brush his teeth with a miswak or any other mean, and to touch or wear any perfume, cologne or fragrance if it is possible and affordable because not everybody could afford to do that. Uh, yet, uh, on the other hand, the Prophet ﷺ prohibited women uh, from wearing perfume upon leaving home, period. As a matter of fact, he said that if a woman is going to the masjid and she wears perfume, then she's not supposed to go to the masjid before she returns and she would take a bath similar to the path, the bath or the shower she would take to remove the major impurity. Then she would be able to leave after that. Because wearing a perfume for a woman is very attractive, similar to wearing an ankle or a bracelet or anything that would make the noise, which the Prophet ﷺ prohibited a woman from wearing, not to bring to the attention of men or passing by men. Uh, that there is a woman here, so that they would uh, look at her. Uh, once uh, the Prophet ﷺ, when he said this hadith, Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him, said that he notes there was a very strong fragrance coming out from a woman. 
was on her way to the masjid. He said, Assalamu alaikum ya amatullah. Peace be with you. What are you hearing? She said, I'm going to the masjid. She said, Allah? Really? Are you going to the masjid for sure? She said, yes. He confirmed once again by repeating the question. She said, certainly. He said, you've got to go home and take a shower and remove this fragrance because I have heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said so and so and so, whatever uh, we've mentioned earlier. So uh, there is a distinction between the going of a man to the masjid and a woman. Uh, whenever a woman is going to the masjid, whether for Isha, for Fard, or for Taraweeh, or Tahajjid, well, يَخْرُجْنَ tafilat, Very ordinary. Not wearing any attractive thing or any attractive perfume. Jazakallah, Sheikh. Okay, we've got the first caller today, Sister Aisha from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Sister, you're live in Ramadan for Tower. Your question, please. Sister Hello? Aisha, are you with us? Oh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, yes. Sheikh, first, uh, may Allah give you more rewards for Amen. this kind of program. Amen. Uh, I have two questions. Okay. Uh, first, uh, it's my first Ramadan here in Saudi, Most and right. my question is, where should I give my zakat of fitr here in Jeddah, or would it be better if I send it to my homeland, which is in the Philippines? And uh, how much is zakat of fitr in Saudi? Okay. And the second one is uh, a woman traveling without mahram is not allowed in Islam. Mm -hmm. So how about uh, a contract worker like me? When I came here in Saudi, I don't have any mahram with me. Uh, is it a big mistake for me? And what should I do to correct that mistake? Uh, thank you and jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Okay, we've got Brother Adnan from the United Arab Emirates. Brother, you're live on Ramadan Fatah. Your question, please. Yeah, hello. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, I want to very, very God bless you for this brilliant job you are doing. Jazakallah khair, brother. May Allah accept you. And actually, I have two questions. First of all, I would like to ask regarding the, you know, working in a bank, while the bank belonging to an Islamic country. Okay. And... While the other which company is running with a bank also with a loan of the bank and having trust on it and working with a company having the interest on it. Regarding working in this company is okay and working with a bank is okay. Okay. And, uh, my second question is regarding, uh, I have uh, an account maintaining in the bank, okay, and this is the balance up, down, up, down always. But since one year it has the average balance uh, around 20 to 25,000 dirhams. So I can pay for the account for this one or I can pay for the current amount which today I have in the account. So okay. for what I should pay the, the card. Okay. Jazakallah Brother Adnan. Play very quick. It's Brother Adnan there from the United Arab Emirates. Okay. A few detailed questions, but I've got everything done. Okay, Sheikh. Um, we've got a question here from Brother Shaquille from the United Arab Emirates. Um, uh, it's a quite an inter interesting question. I think many, many families would, would, would like to know the answer to this. How much money should a person give to their wife? Now, um, he's asking, uh, is she entitled to a certain percentage? Or for, can she take a percentage of my wage? Or generally, is there something for the prophetic hadith that the Prophet said, this is how much you should be given to your wife? Uh, well, in the beginning, I would like to share with you a very interesting hadith mm -hmm. that is narrated by Imam, uh, by, collected by Imam Muslim and narrated by the great companion Abu Hurairah, may Allah mm -hmm. be pleased with him. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says in this uh, particular hadith, "Dinarun anfaqtahu fi sabilillah, a dirham, a dollar, mm -hmm. or any currency that you spend for the sake of Allah." وَدِنَارٌ أَنْفَقْتَهُ فِي رَقَبَةٍ And another dirham or a dollar that you spend to uh, free, to buy and free a slave neck. وَدِنَارٌ تَصَدَّقْتَ بِهِ And another that you give in a charity. And the last one, وَدِنَارٌ أَنْفَقْتَهُ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِكْ And another dollar or a dirham that you spend on your family members. أَعْظَمُهَا أَجْرَىٰ The greatest in regards to reward. Uh, is the dirham or the charity or the spending which you spend on your family members. So the reward of you spending on your family members is not only uh, equal to the reward of spending for the sake of Allah, or freeing a slave neck or giving in charity, it is even greater. And it surpasses the reward of the previous uh, activities. Mm -hmm. So one has to understand that any charity and any spending that you spend on your family members towards their education, tuitions, schooling, clothing, food, uh, medicine, uh, anything like that, and their allowances, as long as you spend moderately, 
neither uh, extravagantly nor being miser, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you a reward greater in spending on your uh, family members than the reward of giving just in a charity. Uh, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also uh, pointed out to the importance of uh, spending on your family members. He said that, وَالْلُقْمَةُ تَضْعُهَا فِي فِي زَوْجَتِكَ صَدَقَةً That when you feed your wife uh, a bite of food, that's an act of charity. So one has to uh, understand that any spending that you do at home and to provide for your family members, that is a charity and it is the greatest reward ever uh, concerning the reward for any other regular charity. This one, the second, we have to understand that uh, uh, providing for the family is a job is a mandatory job for the man, the family father, or the person who's in a child, the husband, the father, and so on. Allah the Almighty says, وَعَلَى الْمَوْلُودِ لَهُ رِزْقُهُنَّ وَكِسْوَتُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ If the task of uh, the woman, the mother, is to suckle uh, her baby and to breastfeed him, then it is the duty of the man, الذي, the one who received the child, رِزْقُهُنَّ وَكِسْوَتُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ is to provide for them and to buy them the regular clothes. A man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm married. What are the due rights of my wife upon me? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, An tut'imaha idha ta'imt. Is to feed her whenever you eat, from whatever you eat, from your regular food. Wa an taksuaha idha ktasayt. And to buy her clothes from the same uh, average or the same kind of the clothes which you buy for yourself. If you buy expensive, you buy her expensive and so on. And that's why, uh, Allah the Almighty says في سورة الطلاق concerning the divorced woman not only the wife but a divorced woman who is during the idda he says لينفق ذو ساعة من ساعته let each one spend according to their capacity so the rich should spend uh, generously according to his richness ومن قدر عليه رزقه فلينفق مما أتاه الله and whosoever Allah uh, stricted his resources and he's poor then let him spend according to his capacity as well Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says La nafsan illa wus'aha. so this is a very important statement which is bil ma'roof with the reasonable basis so each person would spend according to his capacity if mm-hmm. he's rich or poor according to their financial condition many wives do not really pay attention to that rather they compare themselves to rich families and they could compare their husbands who are working class husbands to their employers for instance or their friends who drop them in luxurious cars and so on that's not true uh, you're supposed to look at the availabilities, how much your husband has. It sometimes happens that the husband is kind of uh, strict in spending. Uh, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had a similar case when Hind, may Allah be pleased with her, came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, Inna zawji rajulun shahih. My husband is uh, kind of uh, a miser and he's very tight. Uh, is it permissible for me to take out of his wealth without his knowledge? So the Prophet ﷺ said to her, she's not a working woman, and he's supposed to provide for the entire family. He said, خُذِي مَا يَكْفِيكِ وَوَلَدَكِ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Take what suffices you and your family members, your children, uh, with reasonable basis, or based on uh, whatever you need not what you need to spend as a mean of wasting or buying unnecessary things. So basically, there is no rule where we say that you have to spend that much every month. No. Some people can afford hiring a maid and a driver and a guard. Then they, they should da- do that uh, to give ease to their family members. But if they cannot af- afford to do that, then they should work and assist one another to fulfill uh, uh, the home uh, work together. And a wife should not burden her husband by asking him too much beyond his capacity. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Okay, got a question from uh, Sister Afaf uh, from Egypt. Um, she's asking about young children when they pass away. Now she's saying she's heard from some people that these children go straight to paradise, straight to heaven, and others to the contrary. So she wants some clarification on this. Are young children going to be raised and questioned, Sheikh? Well, it depends. Uh, there is no dispute among the Muslim scholars that uh, the children who are born to Muslim parents, when they die before the puberty age, they end up in paradise definitely. Almost there is a general consensus. Uh, if there is any opposition, is not even considered, is neglected because of the very strong evidences. 
We understand that when one is born, he's born in the pure nature, in the state of the pure nature. So his parents would make him either a Jew or a Christian or an atheist or whatever. A child who's born to Muslim parents, a child who's born to Muslim parents and uh, believers, if he dies before the puberty age, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take him to paradise as well. Uh, there is a very sound reference to uh, that which is narrated by Samar ibn Jundub, may Allah be pleased with him, when he said that the Prophet ﷺ have seen in his journey uh, some kids along with Prophet Abraham, Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi uh, salam, in paradise. He said, what are these? They said, these are Abna'ul Muslimin. Mm -hmm. These are the children of the believers who died before the puberty age. There is no account, there is no accounting for them because the Prophet ﷺ says, رُفِعَ الْقَلَمُ عَنْ ثلاث. Uh, the pen which records one's deeds, whether good or bad, has been lifted and it does not record the deeds of three uh, kind of people. One of them is a child until he or she reaches uh, the puberty age. Mm -hmm. uh, the dispute is concerning the children who were born to non-Muslim parents, mm -hmm. unbelievers. Uh, there are several uh, thoughts concerning that. Some said that, um, well, they will be... Uh, resurrected and they will enter paradise as well because they were innocent, they haven't committed any sin. And some said no, they will be tried and they will be uh, tested and questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment and this is the opinion of the vast majority of the scholars and uh, it is a more right opinion. It is adopted also by Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and his student ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah have mercy on them. And it tends to be accepted among the scholars that it is very fair that the children who were uh, born to non-Muslim parents and they died before the puberty age, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would hold a test for them to determine because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in another hadith when he was asked about the fate of the children of the kuffar, mm -hmm. he said, Allahu a'lamu bihim, Allah knows best concerning them. He knows whether uh, if they have lived, whether they were going to be believers or not. So according, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give them a test and will determine their fate uh, based on that. Jazakallah khashik. Okay, we have a brother Ismail from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Brother, you're live on Ramadan Fatawa. Your question, please. Brother Ismail. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, brother? How are you doing, brother? Uh, I'm Ismail, I'm from Saudi Arabia. Jazakallah khashik. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can hear you. Your question, please. Yes, please guide me about the limit of safar. Okay, I think we're having some problems there with your telephone there, brother Ismail. If you do call back in, uh, we'll put you through straight away. So I'll put that question on hold. Okay, Sheikh, we've got a question from Sister Adawiya. Um, her first question was very similar to Sister Aisha's second question. Uh, it's about uh, sisters who are reverts. Yeah, they're revert in a Muslim country like the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia here. Mm. Uh, what do they do with their situation? Um, they're, they're, they're reverted now. They're here. They're without a mahram. They're not married. How do they travel? How do they, can they, uh, are they allowed to go to Umrah together in groups? And uh, what's their situation? What's your advice for them, Sheikh? Uh, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited women from traveling alone without a male mahram period, mm. unless if it is necessary. And this is not one of the necessary uh, situations. Uh, he prohibited a woman from performing hajj and umrah by herself without mm -hmm. a male mahram. Mm -hmm. So I uh, kindly advise the host families who uh, invite maids from abroad without uh, their male mahram to understand that they're helping people to commit uh, sins that the Prophet ﷺ prohibited. Uh, the family father or the person who hires this female maid is not a mahram by any means. Mm -hmm. He's not the husband nor the father nor the son nor the brother. So accordingly, it's not permissible for her to be alone with him without a male mahram. It's not permissible for her to accompany them even though that he has his uh, wife and kids and so on because the, neither, neither one of them is a male mahram to her. Uh, it is only permissible for a woman to travel uh, the travel distance without a, a male mahram whenever it is necessary and she does not have a male mahram period or is not available. And that happens. Uh, yet it is worth of mentioning here that many of the modern scholars have said that it is permissible for a woman to travel without a male mahram if she is in a safe company. Yet I find this is very difficult to accept, especially in the presence of very strong and sound hadith that the Prophet ﷺ prohibited a woman once in one hadith the distance of a day and night, in another hadith two days, in a third three days. Based on the nature of the question, some uh, people came and they said, Rasulullah, my wife is traveling 
for a day and night. He said, it's not permissible. Uh, three days, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, it is not permissible. And this companion whom everybody by now uh, remembers his story, who uh, was uh, um, chosen to attend uh, with the military, the Muslim army. And when he mentioned to the Prophet ﷺ that his wife uh, was ready to go for Hajj and have sat out already, the Prophet ﷺ said, no, go and join your wife, indicating that even though she was going for Hajj, and she was going in a very safe company that uh, he should have joined his wife, which he did later on. Jazakallah khair, Okay, um, the second question from sister uh, is about her menses. She said that uh, when her menses comes, she bleeds for three days and then she has a rest. Uh, she doesn't bleed for a couple of days, or three days again, and then uh, again three days. She said, how do I calculate uh, my, my period here? Uh, the issue of calculating the period and judging the bleeding, whether it is due to the menses or just a regular bleeding, mm. uh, is a major issue. And really, uh, besides the fatwa of the sheikh, your best mufti is your own self, the woman herself. Uh, even if you go to a gynecologist, he's not going to help you much. might help you uh, in some scientific uh, facts. But uh, uh, in regards to the nature of the bleeding itself, you will be the best judge. By the meaning, uh, some women have their menses seven days, eight days, ten days, up to fifteen days even. So if the bleeding happens with interruption during this period of time, then this is the menses. This is the regular period, which means whether it is a few drops or extensive bleeding, you're not allowed to pray nor fast, and of course your husband is not allowed to approach you sexually. By the meaning, is not allowed to have a complete intercourse with you. Anything uh, beyond or anything other than inter intercourse is permissible. Uh, well, some women, before the period, a few days, they would notice a few drops. If it has during the period itself, the period time which is known to you because it's a habit, mm -hmm. then this is from the period. But if it is off time, um, way after the period is over or way before the period begins, then this is an irregular bleeding due to being exhausted or taking the wrong medication or a side effect of any other thing. It should not stop you from praying or fasting, nor even having an intercourse with your spouse. But you would be required to perform a new wudu for each fard that you pray. And along with this uh, fard, you can pray as many related nawafil as you wish. So if the bleeding happens during the period which you normally have every month, mm -hmm. this is the regular, regular bleeding, uh, your regular bleeding. In addition to, uh, every woman recognizes uh, the blood of the menses with very, very distinct features, such as a very uh, offensive smell and uh, dark red color. So if the color is bright red, this is irregular bleeding. And uh, after the regular bleeding is over, the period is over, a woman could recognize her cleaning through. Uh, after cleaning up, there is a very transparent liquid, colorless, uh, uh, viscid liquid. That indicates that the uterus is already cleaned up. And based on that, she would clean up herself and take a shower. Anything that takes place after that, with different characteristics is irregular bleeding. The sister also inquired about a very important thing I would like to shed some light on it, which is that she sees uh, the bleeding at night. Mm -hmm. Not in the daytime, yeah. Not during the daytime. Can mm -hmm. she fast during the daytime? Of course not. Because whenever there is bleeding, that means you're not allowed to fast, nor pray, nor have an intercourse with your husband, or touch the Quran. As long as there is bleeding, whether it goes on and off, and whether or whether it is uh, continuous. Jazakallah khashak. Okay, uh, Sister Aisha, uh, she rang in and asked a, a question regarding giving sadaqah. She said it's her first year in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. She wants to know, how does she go about giving the sadaqah to the fitr? Uh, can she give it in Saudi itself, or can she, is she allowed to give it in her home country? That's the first this question. answer will be valid whether uh, is it sadaqah to fitr or your zakat or mal. Uh, you should... Begin by satisfy, satisfying the need of your local people. If they're poor in your locality, you should satisfy their needs first. But sometimes there are emergencies, like in, uh, in some countries there is a hurricane, there is a flood, there is a, a drought, there is a, a hunger, whatever. So in this condition, 
we say that we chip in and try to assist these people by uh, paying out of our charity, whether it is regular charity or the mandatory sadaqa, sadaqatul fitri, or zakatul mal. Such as if the person have uh, family members who are uh, desperately in need, of course they will be giving precedence to uh, friends and to regular people. This is another condition. But the regular uh, and the original ruling is that if there are uh, needy people in your locality, you should satisfy their needs first. Okay, Jazakallah Khair Sheikh. I've got a question here from the internet, uh, Brother Kushai. Now he's asking a, a question uh, about taking insurance out. Now he says, what type of insurance are allowed? Because he says the insurance that he's trying to take out is educational insurance for his child. So after several years, he'll build enough money to be able to pay for education when she gets older. She, he says, is this allowed, this kind of in insurance, because this is for education? Maybe some of the viewers who have not uh, attended <coughs> Askuda before uh, would not get a full picture why uh, insurance is not permissible. I mean commercial insurance. Commercial insurance, not the social security or the government insurance. I'm talking about the commercial insurance where you pay uh, subscription fees to a commercial company uh, with the condition that if anything goes wrong with you, that they would cover your uh, uh, medication or they uh, cover the accident or they pay for a new car, etc. Uh, this is some sort of gambling, simply because when you pay the payments, you're not sure whether you will collect them or not. Some people keep paying, and by the end of their life, they have not uh, uh, collected a single profit or a single uh, gain out of this. Of course, uh, this is some sort of gambling. And some people, right after they pay the first payment, uh, maybe uh, they will die or an accident will take place or whatever, and they collect uh, hundreds of times more than what they have paid. And this is exactly the gambling which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. So the kind of insurance which the Muslim is allowed to use, number one, is uh, insurance that's sponsored by the government or the authorities. Number two is insurance which is mandated by the state, even if you're living in a non-Muslim state, so you don't uh, buy the full coverage, rather you, you, you buy the premium, whatever is really uh, needed and necessary. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Okay, we've got a call here from Nigeria. Brother, you're live on Ramadan Fatawa. Your question, please. Salam brother. Yeah, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah, brother. Your question, please. Yeah, please. Yeah, my question. <laughs> I'm calling in respect of the hajjud. Okay. No. Yeah. Is it is it permissible for you to pray at home with your with your wife, at, or you is for you to go to the mosque with your wife? Which one is more, more, more? You know what I mean is yes. for me to pray with my wife at home. Okay. Or What's more recommended? Yeah. Mosque. Okay. Jazakallah. Allah barak fiqah. Brother Babakura there from Nigeria. Okay, Sheikh, just before we take the short break, just this question about tahajjud, I think we'll attack it just after the break. Uh, but they, they, it's the same, isn't it? Qiyamah, layl, tahajjud, no. and tarawi. Yes. There's no difference between all three Correct. of them? Correct. Jazakallah, Sheikh. Okay, we're going to take a, a short break, and uh, inshallah return in a couple of minutes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Each day we'll take one step closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to the Quran, to our way of life. Each day we will explore the acts of worship that we do and we will find out how they relate to our hearts, how they impact our souls, how they help us understand the reality of existence. All of this and much more in our show, One Step Closer. All of you are invited to join us, share your stories, share your aspirations, share your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll be happy to have you on board. Join us in One Step Closer. Recite the Quran.
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Ramadan Fatawa. Let me just remind you of our telephone numbers. The country code is 202, then it's 38555-248 or 249. Okay, we've got two calls waiting. Brother Muhammad from Nigeria. Brother, you're live on Ramadan Fatawa. Your question, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good, uh, good day, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Yeah, I have a zakat question. Okay. Uh, I have bought shares from many companies and they are paying me dividends, which is like profit. Mm. Uh, I want to pay the zakat. Am I supposed to pay uh, from the dividend only or from both the dividend and the shares? Okay. Thank you very much. That's uh, my question. Okay. okay, Jazakallah. That's Brother Muhammad there from Nigeria. Okay, Sheikh, I've got a question here. A uh, previous uh, part from Brother Adnan uh, from the UAE. Now he's asking about banks. He's saying working in a bank in an Islamic country is this allowed? Because we spoke previously extensively about uh, not working in a bank. Uh, then he says, well, what's the difference between working in a bank to working in a company which takes a loan from a bank? And this is an interest-based bank. Am I allowed to work in a company like this? Uh, uh, concerning banking. Mm-hmm. Whether it's in a Muslim country or a so-called Muslim country or a non-Muslim country, what really determines the permissibility of any act, whether it is in compliance with the Sharia or not. Mm -hmm. So if you happen to see a bank in the most sacred place on earth, but it does not comply with the Sharia rules, Mm -hmm. then uh, dealing with such bank and such transaction is haram. At least on an individual basis, we cannot change the entire world, but we can at least work on ourselves. Mm-hmm. Avoid the haram, avoid feeding our families and providing for them from unlawful sources. This is as far as the bank. So what really determines is the policy of the bank itself, not where does it exist. Mm-hmm. In, uh, in, in the West nowadays, there are some uh, uh, Muslim and Sharia compliant banks. So it's not because it's in a Muslim country that means it's uh, Sharia compliant and if it is in a non-Muslim country, it is not. Uh, As far as the the company, uh, it's almost impossible to find a company now which does not take a loan from the bank. And that Mm -hmm. does not stop the the employees from working, the workers, engineers, accountants from working in this company. The sin, if there is a sin, is on the person who is managing this process, not on the worker who works for a specific field and gets paid for that. But in the case of the bank, your main task is serving this illegal uh, business transaction, which is paying interest, and collecting interest. So you're a part of this process. Whether you're a clerk or an accountant or a front desk or a customer service, you are a part of this uh, symphony. Mm -hmm. But in the case of working for a company which deposits its money in the bank or takes a loan from the bank, you have nothing to do with that. Jazakallah, Sheikh. Okay, uh, Brother Mohammed from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Brother, you're live on Ramadan Fatawa. Your question, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum alaikum salam. salam. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, I have a question. This is, uh, does the intravenous or intramuscular injections other than nutrition or vitamins nullify the fast? Okay. Yeah, and I have a second question. Does the application of any lotion or antibiotic cream on the body nullify the fast as well? Okay. Okay, thank Bar- you. Barakallah Fikr. It's Brother Muhammad there from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Okay, Sheikh. Uh, Brother Adnan had another question. Uh, and maybe I need some deeper clarification. He was trying to understand how does he go about paying zakah. He said he's had a, a certain amount of money in his bank account and he stays at that amount now. He said twenty to 25,000 dirhams. He says, how do I go about working my zakah? I think some explanation on what zakah is due upon. Well, let us uh, join the answer of this question to the latest question concerning um, the stock uh, the shares, shares and yes. the, the mm-hmm. profit and so on. Uh, If one happens to uh, possess the minimum requirement, Mm -hmm. which is a catapult, which we call it in fiqh and in Islam, an nisab, which is equivalent to the value of 85 gram of gold, 24 Mm carat. Today's value of each gram is so much. So times 85, let's say it's fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars $1,500, I'm assuming, okay, because it varies, fluctuates. So if you happen to have $1,500 in saving, in investment, more than your basic needs, 
personal use, you and your family, and you maintain this for a complete Islamic lunar calendar, uh, 355 days, then you must pay the cow only 2.5%. Well, I made a profit on this uh, $12,000, $13,000. It grew up and it became 20. Only in the 11th month, I got another $8,000. Uh, and I got this and I got that and so on. We add all of that together and we pay the zakah 2.5% on the due date, the date which you started having the nisab, the, what's equivalent to 85 gram uh, of gold. Uh, of course, people vary. Some people set a date every year at the beginning of Ramadan, the middle of Ramadan, the day of Arafah, the day of Ashura, whatever, whenever you started your nisab. But at that date, you calculate and estimate how much you have in position as far as investment, even though you cannot collect them right now. Properties that you put for sale, uh, uh, a person who has a car lot and has 10 cars, he owns them and he put them for sale. They are not being sold yet. The, today's value, he estimated, he estimates today's value and he considers that in, as a cash, then he pays the zakah on it. So similarly, if the brother had a capital sum invested in the stock market, for instance, then they collected a profit on it. He pays a zakah on the total sum, not on a part uh, uh, regard uh, and uh, setting aside the profit, no. On everything that you possess. Uh, saving likewise, if it increases, if it decreases, whatever you actually have on the day of paying the zakah, this is the amount which is zakatable. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. Okay, brother, um, brother Babakur asked a question uh, um, about tahajjud. Now he wants to know, basically, is it better for him to go to the mosque with his wife or to keep his wife at home and tell her to pray in the house? If a man is praying by himself, and particularly the fard, everybody knows that it is 27 times greater if you pray in jama'ah in the masjid. Mm -hmm. In addition to each prayer, whether fard or otherwise, whenever you uh, perform a proper wudu at home, then you make your way and you head to the masjid. Each step that you take to the masjid uh, raises you in ranks one degree and erases one of your sins. And that's applicable, of course, for everyone. But now we're talking about at tahajjud, the voluntary prayer. If a man can lead the prayer with his wife at home regularly and would not get bored, that is fine. But praying the qiyam, or Salatul Taraweeh in the masjid is more recommended because it gives a feeling of freshness and activity to the congregation. Because after iftar and having dinner, people tend to be uh, kind of heavy, sleepy. But when you go to the masjid, you pray Salatul Isha and you follow that with Salatul Taraweeh, it encourages everybody to pray with the Imam until you finish the prayer. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, whosoever prays, the night prayer with his imam until he finishes, including Salatul Watr, it will be considered for him as Qiyam Layla, and he will be rewarded for praying all night long. If you can do that along with your wife, where you don't have any other commitments, that's of course preferable. If you have any other duties, so basically the decision would be, would be based on your uh, personal condition. Okay, we have uh, Brother Muhammad uh, from Nigeria. Brother, you're live on Ramadan Fatawa. Your question, please. Uh, my question is that, can one, uh, like in the last 10 days of Ramadan, there is this prayer we used to do called Tahajjud. So can one now do both the Tahajjud and Tarawi? As, uh, can one, uh, somebody that do Tahajjud, can he also do Tarawi? Okay. So he would do one and two one. Okay. Okay, Jazakallah Khair. Brother Muhammad uh, from Nigeria. Okay. Sheikh, okay, we had uh, this question uh, from Brother uh, Muhammad from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and I think you understood it better than I no. did, um, about using injections. He said, is this allowed? Uh, does it nullify fast? Uh, the brother is asking concerning intramuscular injection during fasting. Does it nullify fasting? No, it does not nullify fasting. Especially it is not nutritive and it is not uh, vitamins. Uh, so it does not break one's fasting, nor does it affect it. Okay, great. And uh, the second question he asked, uh, uh, similar, what breaks fast? Is using a lotion, an antibacterial cream, does that break your fast? These uh, um, uh, superficial and topical applications does not affect fasting by any means. 
even if it is oil, it does not absorb, uh, the, the skin does not absorb it and it takes it into the abdomen. That doesn't happen. It is truly that it's absorbed by the skin to some extent. But uh, what really nullifies fasting, whatever goes into your uh, stomach and intestine, into your abdomen. And as long as that doesn't happen, then it does not affect your fasting by any means. Okay, Jazakal uh, Brother Muhammad uh, from Nigeria, uh, again, in some clarification here, he says, if somebody prays to Hajjad regularly and now Tarawih has come, how does he go about combining both of those? Can he pray Tarawih then go home and pray to Hajjad? Uh, I believe that was the last question. Yes. Okay, I believe also he inquired about the last 10 days of Ramadan are coming and yes. now we're going to pray to Hajjad. Mm -hmm. So the question raises a flag that it seems like uh, to Hajjad is only prescribed in the last 10 days of Ramadan, which is not true. Mm. We only do extra worship during the last 10 days of Ramadan, uh, seeking the night of Al-Qadr, Laylatul Qadr. But uh, uh, the tahajjud is prescribed not only during Ramadan, throughout the entire year. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala advised His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as saying, وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَتَهَجَّدْ بِهِ نَافِلَةً لَكَ عَسَىٰ أَنْ يَبْعَثَكَ رَبُّكَ مَقَامًا مَحْمُودًا So the command and the advice of uh, per uh, performing tahajjud is not limited to a certain night but throughout the entire year and the Prophet sallallahu used to pray at night until his feet would swell and when he was asked Ya Rasulullah why do you do that while Allah has forgiven you all your sins the Prophet sallallahu replied by saying Afala akunu abidan shakura shall mm -hmm. I not be a grateful servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so basically Praying tahajjud is a mean of giving thanks and showing gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the entire year. But more, we do it extra during Ramadan and particularly during the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Uh, at tahajjud could begin as early as after you pray Salatul uh, Isha. So Salatul Tarawih is actually some uh, form of tahajjud and Qiyamul Layl. At tahajjud is another form of Qiyamul Layl. Perhaps you're asking about what if I pray with the Imam Salatul Tarawih? And you just mentioned that if you pray with the Imam all the way until he finishes, including Salatul Watcher, that will be considered for you as Qiyamul Layl, as you have prayed for the entire night. And now I would like to pray Tahajjud afterward. While the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that the last prayer of the day should be Salatul Watcher, and I have already prayed my watch. What am I supposed to do? Skip the water with the Imam, then I pray tahajjud and do it by the end. This is another, this is one, uh, one way. And there is another way to do it, which is to pray with the Imam until he finishes his salah, including the water. Then you pray tahajjud afterward, and there is no blame on you, and you don't need to repeat your water. And there is another form or another way you can do it, which is you pray with the Imam the watch then you don't do taslim, you pray an extra rak'ah. So it was watr or art for the imam and it has become even or shaf'ah for you. Then when you come to pray tahajjud, when you come to pray tahajjud, uh, you can pray watr by the end of that prior to Salatul Fajr. In some masajid, they announce to the congregation that we're praying taraweeh, whether eight rak'ahs or more, but we're not praying watr. We're going to postpone Salatul Watr until we pray Tahajjud afterward and we'll pray it by the end of the night prayer. Jazakallah Hashak. Okay, we have Brother Moez from Nigeria. Brother, your life on Ramadan Fatawa. Your question, please. Okay, Salaam Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam. Alaikum Salaam. Alaikum Salaam. Alaikum. My question. Yes. Yes. Uh, in Nigeria, we have banking laws. Most of the law is that we have a Sharia law in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But the banking system is against Syria. What okay. is the status of the Muslim working in the banking system which is against Syria law? Okay. Jazakallah khair, brother. It's Brother Moiz there from Nigeria. Jazakallah khair, brother, for that question. Okay, we have Brother Shazad from Qatar. Brother, you're live on Ramadan Fatah. Your question, brother. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have a question. Is it permissible to, to take Pusle Janaba after Sahur? Okay. And, uh, and moreover, I mean, after that, uh, we, I mean, both the husband and wife, we can take a ghusl and we can offer Latul Fajr. Okay. Is it permissible? Okay. Jazakallah khair, brother. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah fiqh. Jazakallah khair for that question there. Okay, Sheikh, just before we, we go to these questions, just got a, a question on the internet. Uh, uh, a brother 
um, he's asking about his, his wife, and this is it's something which we've got so many questions. I mean, if I go to the, our question, maybe one in every ten would be asking the same question. Sisters are praying a Salat al-Tarawi at home following the television uh, so, for example, Saudi, for example, shows the Tarawi from Mecca. Uh, Alhamdulillah, Huda TV does the translation, and we show it on Huda TV here. Uh, they say Allah Akbar, and they stand behind the television. Um, is this something allowed, Sheikh? I think that would be cool if it was allowed, <laughs> that uh, one could be uh, at the convenience of being at home and uh, having his tea or coffee next to him and praying behind the Imam of Al-Haram. <laughs> but uh, no, it is not valid. Uh, the ma'mum or the follower should at least see and hear the imam or see or hear the imam. At least they should hear the imam. Somebody will say, well, we hear him on television and see him too. Mm -hmm. But without such barrier. To the point if uh, the imam is praying in a masjid and there is a street, a highway or cars driving by, then those who are after the street uh, should not follow the imam because this is not a jama'ah. To follow the imam, the rules have to be connected. And that's why if you happen to go to Umrah or Hajj, especially during Ramadan or especially during Hajj, you would see an amazing thing. You would see the rows of the musallin would extend to the distance of almost half a mile outside the masjid. As long as the rows are extended and connected, and no barriers such as highways, or streets, or rivers, or channels, it is permissible. But you cannot sit in your hotel room and there is a space downstairs and say, I'm going to follow the Imam. Likewise, you cannot pray behind your television set. It will be sufficient if you go and pray behind the Imam in your local masjid. Or if you don't have an access, you can pray at home. And it is preferable for women to pray at home if they're going on their own. Okay. Brother Mo is from Nigeria. I asked a question. Uh, about the banking system in this country. He said it's not Islamic. It doesn't that has been Islam. answered so and uh, let's save the time. Yes, I, I was going to say that's been answered. Just one question about this. that, uh, Like you said, you just need to clarify. It doesn't matter which country it's in. It's still it a doesn't. banking system. Yes. Okay, great. Jazakallah khair. Okay, I missed a question from before, but the reason why I missed it was to keep it at the end, really. Uh, Sister Aisha from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, she's asking about Zakat al-Fitr. What constitutes this? How do you go about paying Zakat al-Fitr? Uh, especially now that we're coming uh, to the end of Ramadan soon. How do we go about uh, gathering this, Sheikh? Uh, first of all, the reason why Sadaqat al-Fitr was ordained and prescribed. And who ordained it? Mm. Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah have ordained Sadaqat al-Fitri tuhratun lissa'im min al-rafathi wal laghu It is a mean of purification for the people who have been fasting throughout the month of Ramadan who've committed some mistakes mm -hmm. vain talk, uh, falsehood, uh, backbiting uh, anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislikes while we're fasting so paying Sadaqat al-Fitr is a mean of purifying our souls and bodies from the mistakes we've committed while fasting. Meanwhile, the Prophet ﷺ said, masakin," And it is a mean of feeding and providing for the poor, particularly on that day. And that's why it is prescribed to be paid prior to Salatul Eid. Uh, each person who's capable to pay Sadaqatul Fitr, and the capability will be determined as follows. If you, a Jamil, have at your house food that is enough for a whole day and night that suffices you and your kids, your family members, everyone who's under your guardianship, anything extra over than that, the, the need of a day and night, then you must pay Sadaqat al-Fitr on each and every family member under your guardianship. The Sadaqa is, as the Prophet sallallahu prescribed, Sa'a. A Sa'a is a measure. Uh, interpreted into today's uh, uh, measure or uh, weight uh, as two and a half kilograms of food of wheat, barley, raisin, uh, uh, dates, or macaroni, rice, the average food of what people like. So the vast majority of the Muslim Jews have agreed that the fasting individual who can afford paying Sadaqat al Fitr must pay it in this form which the Prophet sallallahu prescribed. Khalaf al-Imam Abu Hanifan said it is permissible for one to pay the value instead of paying the food. And since I understand that you're pointing to me or out of time, let's postpone talking about this issue 
the difference of opinion concerning paying the value for Sadaqatul Fitr instead of uh, the food, inshallah, to another episode. Okay, then. Jazakallah khair. Okay, we've run out of time uh, as usual. So many calls, so many questions. Uh, please do call in early, otherwise, uh, you're going to be waiting. Until next time, I'll leave you with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ramadan is here, recite the Quran. Ramadan is here, recite the Quran. Ramadan is here, recite the Quran. We pray to Allah to put right our hearts, ask for forgiveness and make a new start. Raising our hands, we ask for His Rahmah. Hear us, our Lord, and grant us Jannah. Ramadan is here, the month that is blessed. Ramadan is here, the month we love best. Ramadan Fatawa.